Hello. Um, I've been here a few times. Lots of people talked about Edinburgh Data. Uh, if you Google it, you'll find that it's, it's sort of all right, but it doesn't really do what everyone needs, and it's only in beta, and you shouldn't really use it. Go and roll your own. Um, we've been using it now for six months or so, um, and I've actually found that once you get under the hood and you know where to go, it's really, really powerful. The real problem with it is it's not documented very well. Um, it has a huge amount of functionality, and I'm going to go through some of that functionality tonight and show you how it can be used if your server isn't the clean Ruby loveliness that you built yesterday, but it's actually something that someone else built six years ago, in our case, 15 years ago, um, and how you can use that with Ember Data. Uh, so from Silver Curve, um, I'm CTO and CEO, um, and the idiot that funds it. Uh, we're experts in digital signage, so replacing posters with screens. Uh, we run the Mothercare network. Uh, I used to run the O2 network uh, through 2,000 shops. Um, and we have created a graphics engine that allows you to do on a Raspberry Pi what you used to have to use an i7 with a quad-core graphics card to do. Um, and that gives you PC quality graphics at a fraction of the cost, about £750 cheaper over five years per screen. <coughs> As a guideline, there's 3,500 screens on escalators in the underground. So they would save close to 2.5 million pounds over five years, most of that in power, by going from a 75-watt device to a 3-watt device. And I'll give you a very quick demo of what our device can do. A standard Raspberry Pi, nothing tricked out on it. Um, once the projector's caught up. So this is rendering in real time on Raspberry Pi. There's no video in this demo. Uh, we've got strokes on text. We've got the ability to, to, to bind text to data. We can do pixel shader ripples in about 10 lines of JavaScript. Um, we've got a dead smooth ticker. Um, I challenge anyone to do that in HTML5, even on an i7. Um, what we're using at the back end is a language called QML, which is a declarative JavaScript language. Rather than in HTML5 saying, right, move, 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 Instead, you just say, I want to go from here to here over 10 seconds on this 3D path with this blur and this fade, go. And the engine gets on and does that on the GPU. Um, and you'll find on these mobile phone chipsets, about 95% of the chip is GPU and about 5% CPU. So anything that's HTML-based is going to really struggle. Um, and that's, that's why we exist. Um, if I just switch that over, then we have a second demo, uh, which, if I can get to it, um, really shows off some of the rendering capabilities. This one takes a little while to load. Um, in this demo, there's nothing that's video. It's all rendered in real time on an $8 chip. Eventually. Um, we're using C++ at the back end for this one, but then our user interfaces are built in HTML5 and JavaScript um, with Ember uh, running in the user's browser where there's plenty of horsepower to play with. What we're trying to do is offload as much as we can off the device itself onto the, uh, the user's browser. So here we go. So this is the sort of thing that we can do with our engine. Again, particle engine at the back uh, with a bokeh effect, blurring in real time on those uh, PNGs. And then Install Media is our Swedish software partner. Um, they implement their platform on top of our engine. So here we've got a piece of text that's editable by the user. It's about 30 milliseconds from editing it in the browser to having it on screen. Um, with a ripple as a reflection. So we're rendering it twice, adding a pixel shader on uh, with the water rippling as well. Hitting 60 frames a second, full HD. Um, complete with beautifully smooth animation. So you sort of CSS3 type animations, but put those on steroids. And I'll do one more. So this is the sort of thing you might see in a, in a restaurant. We're actually um, about to use this for the Burger King um, menu board network. What we allow, basically, is the graphic designer to get at this in a really, really easy to use way without having to write any code. Um, and then the programmer can go and build new effects for the graphic de designers to use. So that's our main business. To achieve that, we need to be able to allow the user to control it. And um, so we use Ember um, in two places. We've got a third party piece of software, they're licensing our engine, and their player is running on the Raspberry Pi. Under their player is our Aperture engine rendering pixels out to the screen. And that third party server might be in the data center 
for the clients. So Marks & Spencer run it in their own data center. Mothercare run it in the cloud that we host for them. Um, and this particular one is a Swedish uh, software company. They have their own HTML5 front end, but it is suitable really only for the expert. It took me about six months to learn how to use it. Um, so we've written our own content management tool on top of their APIs, and we've done that in Ember. We've also got a second interface, which is on the player itself. So the physical player will sit behind the screen. The engineer, when they install it, has to set up the network, set up the screen resolution, uh, detect what the screen is capable of, turn it upside down if they hang the screen upside down, all those sorts of things. So very much like you have a UI on your router at home, we have a UI on the device. The device itself has some static HTML and JS, which is the Ember application, and then some PHP APIs that drill down into the Linux commands to actually go and change the host name, change the IP configuration, that sort of thing. So if I show you what that UI uh, looks like, this is the cloud UI. Uh, so this is content management. Um, let me just zoom in on that. Let me. Oh, it's decided not to zoom today. Um, so here we have two views. We have a dashboard which tells me what the players are, are doing. So here we've got two players that we've disconnected in the office. One of them sitting here, which is why it's not talking. Um, and then we've got one here that's OK. We can tell the IP addresses, um, serial numbers, that sort of thing. So those are talking up to the server every minute or so, telling them what they're doing and asking for new content. And then we're just pulling down. Uh, JSON um, about them and, and displaying it. In the content view, we're showing the slides. So each one of these is a piece of content on the screen. Um, and the graphic designer can create templates for those slides. Those templates have the layout of the text and the images and the animations uh, and the duration, that sort of thing. So if we take this one, for example, this has got, uh, you'll see top left, um, a little preview, which I can zoom up so you can see it in more detail. Um, so we have a title and a subtitle, it's a very simple demo, um, and two images that can be uploaded by the user. So the graphic designer has set up the layout of that slide, and then we're going to populate that with content um, in this user interface. So first of all, we have a slide name, which is how the user's going to see it. Um, that never appears on screen. If it's draft, then um, it's not sent to the screen. If it's published, it's going to be seen on screen. Obviously, very important if you're running a retail network. You don't want next month's promotion to go up early. Um, we've got weighting of play out, so we can play it more or less often than other content. And then we have the data fields that are actually editable from the template. So we've queried the graphic designer's description file, which is a JSON file held within the template. And it'll tell us what properties are available and what types they are. So there might be some text fields, some image fields, a video field, some numbers, a checkbox, whatever it might be. And we're then representing those um, in the UI. So here I can change in a brasserie to uh, in a cafe, because it's stupid to use a French word. Um, and then I can go and choose a file and upload another file, for example. Um, I can also uh, change, is the schedule gone? No. Oh, you've moved it. There we go. Um, so we can change the scheduling rules so I can set the dates that it's uh, available to be on air. Um, if your sale finishes, you don't want the sale advert to come up the next day. Um, and then which days of the week and that sort of thing. So this is some nice little um, multi-select options. Um, so there's a lot more complexity to it, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. So to do that, we are querying back to third-party APIs that someone else wrote on a system that's been developed over about the last 18 years. So we've gone through a lot of technology changes in that time. And some of the APIs date back 18 years. Some of them were written last week. Um, so we need to be able to query all that data, bring it together in the browser, and then render it beautifully. So Ember Data conceptually gives us a briefcase model, i.e., I go home from the office. I've got a pile of papers in my briefcase. There's a subset of what's in the office. And I want to be able to edit those documents, put them back in the briefcase, and when I get back to the office, sync them to the storage in the office. That's essentially what you're doing in the browser um, whenever you bring this data down, munge it, send it back. The difference in Ember data is you can store it for quite a long time in the browser, make lots of changes, and then persist them back. And you can keep them after you've persisted them. So the persistent data means that if I visit a page, show some data, go and do something else, come back, 
that data is already in the browser. It queried it the first time, and it's kept it around for us. We don't have to re-query it, so we give a much more slick user experience. We did have transactions, which I think are a really useful thing in a briefcase model. If I sign three documents and then decide I don't want to sign the third one, I want to roll back that whole transaction. They've been deprecated in 1.0. I don't know if anyone's aware what the long-term plans are for that. No? We'll see what happens with those. Uh, we've got lazy loading. So if I've got, for example, a directory tree that wants to go and get hold of, I don't want to load every single directory just in case the user wants to look at it. As they open up a, um, a folder, I want to bring back just the stuff that's in that folder or just the subfolders ready for them to open the next one. Um, and Ember Data gives me all of that out of the box. And we can customize it. Ember Data has a certain way of doing things. If you don't like it or it's not right for your project, you've got the ability to go and change the way it works. And that's what we've done very heavily in our project. Now, Ember Data, out of the box, likes REST and a very specific format of REST. Uh, so your request to the store, you would find wizard number one. And then when that promise completes, you can get him to wave his wand. That's going to go to the REST adapter, which is part of Ember Data. And that will form a URL, wizard slash one, and ask for a, a URL get. Now, that obviously assumes that that's the correct URL for your server. Now, if you're writing your own server, just write it the way Ember Data likes it. But if you're using something that, that is an existing API or someone else's server, you don't have that choice. The next thing that happens is the server response comes back, and it has to look like that. So we need a wizard or an array of wizards, where one of them is ID 1, um, with a first name and last name. And that will get pumped into a model, again, named wizard. Uh, we have a first name and last name string attribute on it. So that first name will get pumped into the first name for you. So all the code you have to write to use it is that. All of that is done by Ember Data and your server. Sorry, you have to write the model as well. But all you have to do is, is make sure the names in the data coming in match the names in the model. Now, obviously, that's only going to work if you wrote the server, because no one else writes code exactly like that. So it's all easy-peasy, lemon squeezy. So if you didn't write the server, you need to start doing some work. And that's where you start hitting the myths in Ember Data. If you Google Ember Data, embedded, polymorphic, lazy load, you'll find 100 posts saying it can't be done, and one little tiny post on page 50 saying it can be done. So the myth is it can only do REST. You'll find lots of places where it says, use the REST adapter. If you're not REST, don't use Ember Data, roll your own. It's, it will say everywhere it can't do embedded records. And that's true of Ember Data 0 0.1, 0 0.2, but now it can. It's not obvious how to do it, but it can do it. And it definitely can't do polymorphism. Absolutely impossible. But if you know where to look, it is entirely possible. <laughs> so if we lift the bonnet and have a look underneath, third party APIs are, let's call them challenging. Um, we, in our project, probably about 80% of those that we list on screen, we're hitting in our project. We've got inconsistent signatures. We've got get and set have a capital S or a lowercase s for the same API. Um, some of the schemas, we push a blob of JSON. Some of them, we encode that into a string and put it in the URL. Um, we've seen strings with a blob of JSON sitting inside the string. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if we found a huge blob of XML somewhere sitting inside a string inside a JSON object contained in a URL. Um, you'll see, if you Google Ember Data, that it has problems with trees of infinite depth. Um, in fact, it doesn't at all. Um, in our case, we have objects that have an ID, but they also have a version. Uh, the whole thing is, is a version-controlled object store. Um, and that gets very complicated, because your URLs get cached, and the caches have to uh, be adjusted for version. Um, so that gets a bit fun. And ours is polymorphic as well. And you saw that in the demo where those properties were listed for the slide. There was a text property, an image property, a video property. The slide just has a list of properties. So we have polymorphism there straight away. Uh, so if we give an example, uh, embedded JSON strings, it's probably a bit small, but uh, we've got a value here that's got a JSON object sitting inside it, inside a text string, um, which means we need to parse it and do all horrible stuff with it. Uh, we've got polymorphic data, and this is the data behind what we just saw in the demo. So we've got an item list, we've got a text title, 
uh, which is a type text, so that's going to map to the model type, and then it's got a value. Um, but in the case of a file, we've got type image, which has a file ID instead of a value. So each of our different types of model have to go and parse the data differently. Um, and we've got non-standard URLs. This one's a particularly fun one. Um, whoever wrote that had had a lot of beer, I think. <laughs> we notified him that one. He said, yeah, well, it might cause some bugs parsing that. Said, yeah. So, Envidota, all your customization will belong to us. Um, to start to customize Ember, you need to, uh, Ember data, you need to know how it works. So, on the left-hand side, you have your root and your controller doing all your beautiful data manipulation and, and pumping it into your views. And on this side, you're working with models, ds.model um, descendants. You're talking to the store. Now, the store is your briefcase. So you open it up, and you pull out whatever's inside it. But if there's a document that you want that isn't in the briefcase, you just open it up and pull it out. It's magically there. The find method on the store will take a type and an ID. So if I want document number seven, I just ask for find document comma seven. And it returns a promise. If it's got it, it'll just immediately resolve the promise and there's my data. If it hasn't got it, it'll go back to this lot and request it and bring it back to me. But it brings it back exactly the same to this side as whether it had it immediately or whether it had to go back to the server and get it. On this side, we deal with records, which are plain old JavaScript objects. Um, the basic is a name mapping between the two. And on this side, we don't deal with models at all. We only deal with records. So the adapter is responsible for communicating with the server. Um, it's building the URLs. It's requesting the data. And in very simple cases, it could munge the data into the format that Ember data wants. But I would thoroughly recommend you don't do that. The serializer's job is to munge the data. So it doesn't talk to the server. It, uh, it just gets given a blob of data from the adapter in server format, and it sends it back in store format, which is the nice, beautiful format that you'll see when you read the Ember data docs. Um, you just bring it back as if it came from a nice, clean REST server. When you're saving data, it takes the store data, munges it through the serializer into server format, and then pushes it back to the adapter. And then we push off to the server. And that's true in almost all cases. There are some cases where you might have a single model in the store, but it's actually stored in two or three different places in the server. Maybe half of it's stored in one place and half of it's stored somewhere else. And in that case, the adapter isn't restricted to making one call. You can make as many calls as you like. So you can munge that data in the serializer into, for example, three child uh, JavaScript objects. And then the adapter can send each one off in, in three separate calls to the server. And you have to deal with what happens if one of those calls fails. Uh, but that's the fun of programming. Uh, so Andy here is our lead Ember developer. Um, and he's going to talk through some of the examples of how we've used these technologies to build our code. Right. So uh, yeah, basically just going to show you the ways we've, done, we've dealt with some of these problems. Um, as Brian said, we've got this problem with embedded records, supposedly. Um, you can have sort of the, the kind of code on the left coming back from the server. And by default, Ember data doesn't really know what to do with that. It just kind of falls over. Um, and you probably get some cryptic error message. Uh, it does like what you've got on the right. Um, so what we have is this side-loading technique um, where we've basically stripped out the template data and we've put it into an object alongside our slide. Um, and Ember will play with that quite happily. That is something that uh, we have found to be done quite nicely in the serializer, um, just because it's, it's manipulation of the response that's come from the server. Um, so just to get a little bit more involved. Um, this kind of relates to what Brian showed you earlier, that list of different properties in our UI. So what we can have is a definition of models as we have in the yellow text up there. So we have a template which quite simply has a list of template properties. And the important thing there is we have 
we pass in the polymorphic option um, into our has many. And just a side note, that little object that you pass in there can be very, very useful. You can basically put arbitrary stuff in there and pull it out later um, if, you have, if you need to flag certain properties or what have you. Um, so it's pretty handy. There are a few built-in properties that Ember Data makes use of out the box. Um, then if we have, we define just a, a base template property model and then just in our example we derive a text template from that. Uh, actually no we don't because that's a mistake in the code there. That should be um, over here, it should be an app.template property. But you get the idea. Um, <laughs> one person noticed that before we did. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> Who was it? <laughs> um, so yes, you can do that. We've got our model set up and that's nice and easy. And then let's say we have the response on the left there from the server when we look up this particular template. And again, we can simply just go through and do our extract those embedded properties into side-loaded data there. And um, the, the key thing is that w instead of just a numerical string ID, we have an object which has an ID and a type. And um, although it's not really documented anywhere, the combination of this and this flag basically just makes Ember data happy. Um, that's all there is to it, really. And you can quite easily get uh, a polymorphic list there, for example. So that's not as bad as people made out. Now, with non-standard URLs, there are quite a few ways of dealing with it, depending on how horrendous the API is. Um, if you have the sort of standard RESTful ending um, to your URL, then you can just derive from the built-in REST adapter, and you can supply a namespace and a host, for example, if you need to. And then when Ember Data goes off and builds a URL to make a request to, it will take those into account, and you'll get the request made to the right URL. If it's a little bit less uh, restful, shall we say, you've got the chance to the option of overriding REST adapters build URL method. Um, and really, you can return whatever you want in there. Um, yeah, that. So. <laughs> um, and then Ember data will make its request as it normally would, but to the URL that you have built. Um, so that allows you quite a high degree of control over your URLs. Um, an alternative, if, for example, I mean, something that we've come across with this API that we're working with is we need to make two, three, maybe more different requests to get even seemingly linked bits of data for one model. Um, so that, that doesn't really play that well with Ember Data on its own. So what we can do if we're, if we're finding a particular, or if we're calling a find, we've got find, find all, find query, that kind of method. We can basically override the Ajax request that is made by the default REST adapter. So we can have our own custom adapter, override any of those methods we like, and then we can kind of do whatever we want in there. And you know, you've got nice things for, for situations where you have to, for example, make a number of requests for one particular find query, for example. Things like um, you've got Ember's RSVP methods. Uh, something like hash is quite nice there. You can take the promises from your three requests, put them into one hash, and just wait for that whole thing to resolve. Um, so that's quite a nice little trick. Same goes for create record, update record, delete record. Um, you, you can basically do what you like. I'll show you an example in a moment of where we've had to override create record because 
because of this, this API. I'm not going to say anything bad. Then you've got the issue of non-standard data. Um, the easy way of handling it is to just basically butcher it ourselves into the form that we want it in. Um, a nice little thing that we came across that made our lives a lot easier um, was uh, a way of basically stripping the data that we get back from the server and putting it into a really nice RESTful format that uh, Ember Data is happy with. Um, so, as it says there, um, and that was a big step in simplifying the way that our data is handled. You've also got uh, options of overriding methods on the serializer. So you can extend the serializer. By default, Ember Data will use the REST serializer. But you can go from just the base serializer if you're happy implementing a number of methods yourself. Um, you have quite a number of possibilities in the serializer for controlling how you handle your data. And I'm going to be perfectly honest here. I haven't quite sussed out what is the correct way of doing this. Um, you have extract single and extract many methods, which are called by Ember Data in response to either a find or find query, for example, which will give you, um, uh, it could give you a list of objects back. And actually, that should be extract array rather than extract many. Um, and that's what will then get called on your serializer. The list of uh, returned objects gets passed in, and you can do what you want with it in there. Same thing happens with extract single. If you do find by ID, for example, you'll only get one object back. Extract single gets called to process that payload. You've also got um, normalized payload. I think there's a normalized hash method as well, which I haven't actually really looked into. Um, and they, again, give you a chance to play around with the objects that you get back from your requests. Um, so the purpose of these things, as far as we're concerned, is to rearrange the data that we get back from the server into a format that Ember Data will happily play with without us having to make any other changes down the line. So I'm going to show you some real code. Um, this is probably actually going to be too small. Let me see if I can zoom in. Ah, oh, well done. So, is that, that's way too small, isn't it? Let's keep zooming. Can, zoom well. can you? Yeah. How? <laughs> Same way? Yeah. Okay. Right. Let me just grab. I should probably have found this earlier. Look at that. That's better. Right. So uh, we have this adapter. And go easy on me. It was the first thing I wrote out of uni. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's evolved, shall we say, from its initial implementation. Now, we've got some examples of issues that we faced. So this is our create record. Um, there's probably a better way of doing this, so if anyone knows it, please talk to me about it. Um, now, the first thing that we've done here, which is a little bit non-standard, is that our serialization takes place inside our create record method. That seems a little bit dirty, to be perfectly honest. There's a reason for it, um, which is that when we serialize our data, we need to, for example, upload files to the server and we need the ID that the server assigns that file before we can persist our actual slide data. And obviously, uploading a file is not hugely synchronous. Um, so we, we have, in this case, an asynchronous serialization method. Um, because by default, serialization is synchronous. Uh, so we can do this. We can wait around for it. And when we're done with that, uh, we need to make an AJAX request. So we've kind of just built this wrapper for getting a URL because we, again, have to deal with non-standard URLs. Um, 
So we've, this is effectively an override for something like REST adapters um, build URL. Uh, it's just we kind of rolled our own before we really realized that you could just override what was already there. Um, so that gives us our URL to make our request to. Once we get that back, we unfortunately have to make a second request um, simply because all of our uh, the, the data is stored in nested data sets. And the first call, unfortunately, won't allow you to specify a parent for the newly created one. So we have to create one and then append it to its parent, um, which, unfortunately, we couldn't find out from the uh, API documentation. So there are a lot of orphans floating around in our test space. <laughs> um, so that's, that covers kind of multiple calls within a single operation, um, non-standard URLs, also the nastiness of um, having asynchronous um, serialization. Uh, we have, I'm trying to think if we've got any other examples. We've got some serializer stuff, which I don't think is actually particularly interesting. So worth looking only at the, <coughs> um, the side loading piece, that back end object that, that yeah. um, we send it from. So we've got this, uh, our own little base class, which we've derived from REST serializer. Now, this is basically what we have to go through and pull out embedded records and pop them into side-loaded data. Um, so we just have a few methods in there, which we'll go through and do that. It's fairly straightforward stuff, um, just kind of handle with, uh, sorry, handling relationships. So for example, um, if we specify that we've got an embedded relationship, we then check if it's a one-to-one -one or if it's a has many example, we'll, um, we'll handle that accordingly. This options object you see here is the one you saw earlier with a polymorphic flag in it. Yep. Um, so you can look at any flags you like. And this is actually iterating the model and looking at the metadata of the model to see what it should do with it. Um, this code is heavily based on someone else's code, and we couldn't actually find tonight where we got it from. Uh, but if you Google embedded REST adapter, um, about 99% of that is in here. Um, we've made some mods for our case. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a huge amount more to show. Have I missed anything? Um, yeah, you look at the, the polymorphic embedded models. OK. So. And your Ajax mixing. What we have is. This is um, for these polymorphic properties that we were looking at earlier. Um, so what we do is we make sure that instead of just assigning IDs, we assign these objects which um, contain both a type and an ID. And passing that through Ember data allows polymorphism to magically happen. Um, I mean, basically, if you, if you go into the Ember data source code and search for polymorphic, you'll find where that gets, gets treated. Uh, I think it's, there's probably only about one or two occurrences of the word polymorphic or polymorphism in the entire source code for it. Um, unfortunately, not really documented, but it was kind of a last ditch thing to search for polymorphic in there. We found that you can just pass in this object. Um, that was a good day. <laughs> so, yeah, that pretty much covers it. Um, so, basically, all we want to show is that Ember data is not necessarily as rubbish or limited as a lot of people seem to whine about on the internet. Uh, if you actually have a look at what it can do, there's a huge number of methods that you can override, a huge number of properties that you can tweak on the built in. Um, you know, adapters, serializers, this kind of thing. And even if that isn't quite enough for you, 
you know, just having an understanding of the structure of this code means that you can just make your own little tweaks to it, little adjustments as you need to, uh, just to be able to handle whatever horrors some API designer might be able to throw your way in 15 years' time. <laughs> Like in total, six months. We've six understood months. it really for about four or five weeks. Yeah, we've done a lot of rewrites in the last four or five weeks. Okay. But those rewrites are things that took us a month to two months originally, and in a day we brought in all this stuff and went, oh, actually, we can get rid of 90% of the code. Yeah. It's all already there. The problem is it's not documented. You don't know it's there. It was much, much easier. Um, all the little nasty little bugs that meant it sort of worked have gone. Um, I don't think we've actually got any Ember data bugs. Yeah, we, we're using beta 3. We haven't used beta 4 yet. Um, we're using beta 3, and it just works. Yeah, that's the other gotcha. If you're looking at stuff about Ember data, if you're looking at stuff that's a year or so old or older, ignore it. Just, yeah. Yeah. Just discard it. If it's less than six months old, it's probably okay. If it mentions beta 3, then you probably ought to be believing it. If it doesn't, leave it alone. Yeah. No, I mean, we're only adding, what, 50 lines of code? Um, yeah. We're making the same query to the server, which is the slow bit, um, okay. that Ember response, would be working. Yeah. Well, a little bit, but there will be. we're not talking about megabytes of data. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm sure if you were, I mean, something has to transform it. Yeah, that's true. Um, so it, it has to be transformed at some point into the store. We may as well make it easy for the store and do the hard bit under our control. Yeah. So one final thing, if you like what we do, we will be hiring in the autumn. We're raising about 300,000 pounds at the moment in equity on uh, Cedars, the crowdfunding site. So if you've got £13.46 in your pocket and you'd like a share of Silver Curve, you can go to Cedars and, and buy one. Um, we're taking investments up to £100,000 each. So if any of you have got £100,000 in your pocket, wearing a hole in it, come and give it to me. <laughs> any questions other than the obvious ones? Let's just hear it for these guys for the obvious questions. Between the adapter and the serializers, you talked about the situation in which you had um, cases where a record in uh, Ember data may translate into uh, multiple stores or multiple records mm -hmm. in, in the back end. Uh, whose responsibility is that? Between the, the serializer obviously needs to transform into the format that the server is going to need. Yeah. It seems to make sense if you've got, say, you've got three calls to the server to set the data, to have the uh, adapter, so the serializer return an object with three sub-objects in it, which are the three parts that we need to send back. Um, what we tried to do was say the, uh, the adapter doesn't do any transformation. There are some points where that's not possible because there are some transfers you need to do before you make the second call to the server. But if we take the, the, the target that it shouldn't do any transformations, and if we find it has, think carefully about it, then that seemed to work very well for us. Um, equally, the serializer is synchronous so it can't talk to the server. So all the serializer is allowed to do is transform data. Um, so we, you do have the option in the adapter to even take the output from the serializer and, and mess about with it again. We decided not to take that route and just say whatever comes out of the serializer should be exactly as open data wants it. And that embedded REST serializer was a great help in that, um, using the metadata of the model to, to navigate and find out is this an object or an array or a property, what should I do with it? I have one other question too. So the, the little option property yeah. about polymorphism, um, how much code is that impacting within Ember Data? Very, it? very little, really. Yes. Yeah, it just um, it basically just uses it to say when you're pushing an object into the store, what type it should be. So rather than you create a record of a specific type and that type gets passed down all the way through to your push object, for example. Um, yeah, it, it just pulls it out from there. So there's just kind of a, I think it's like a three case thing of 
is it a number, is it a string, no, is it an object, yes, okay, we must be polymorphic, yeah. and it just, it just handles that. You see that here, where the type tells it where to, which array to get it from in your side-loaded data. Um, so it's going to do a pluralization of that, find the text template properties, and go and load it from that block. Obviously, if it knew the type in advance, it would know exactly where to go. And you'll see a few places in the back end where you have a, all through the store, you have prop, uh, methods that take store type and ID. And what you see in polymorphism is it overrides that type. So the type is the base type, but it'll then override it with a descendant type once it works it out. And you can actually make use of that in your adapter. If, for example, if we're going to go and find a uh, animal from, from the server, but the server sends back a cat, I need to store it in the store as a cat, and not as an animal. So in the adapter, we've actually changed the type that we send back um, to be a cat rather than an animal. And we do that by, rather than having a list of animals, have a list of cats, a list of dogs, whatever else. Unfortunately, zero documentation on that. You have to actually go and go through the exceptions in the code and find out why Ember Data doesn't like it. It's not fun. Who's using data-driven backends that, that they didn't write in this room? Nobody. Wow. Lucky, Brian. lucky people. Any, any vacancies <laughs> going? <laughs> so some of you can sleep at night. That's really not fair. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.